It is a real delight to be joined with the wonderful mayor of London. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview with me. It is really, really appreciated. And I know it will be of immense benefit to many who will be watching. In the first instance, I trust that you and your family are keeping well. And, uh, no, our family are very well. Thank you very much for asking. I hope you're well, and, and more importantly, the congregation. I hope they're well as well. But it's a pleasure to uh, join you and have a conversation with you uh, during the course of this evening. Thank you so much. Yes, it's, it's been a rough time, and I think let's just jump straight into it. I mean, just the way we dealt with this. Different countries, different governments have taken varied approaches to the pandemic. And now, of course, each introducing their own easing of lockdown. Looking a little closer to home, um, from a communal perspective, arguably, we went into lockdown perhaps a little bit late, and there was a fair amount of loss of life in, in the Jewish community. But my question to you is, what is your take on the UK handling of COVID-19 and, indeed, the process of our current easing? Well, firstly, this, this global pandemic has been, frankly speaking, awful. Uh, the human cost you mentioned just in the Jewish community, but across our city, across our country, across the globe, the numbers of people who've lost their lives because of the pandemic has been huge. Uh, but also, I genuinely think uh, there are lessons to learn because this won't be the last pandemic we face, I'm afraid. Globalization means the world is a smaller place. That means it's easy for a virus to pass and a virus doesn't respect city boundaries national boundaries or international boundaries and it's really important for us to learn lessons and you're right we've got to have the humility as a country to realize in fact there are lessons we should learn in real time in relation to what other countries have done that worked that didn't work the lessons we can learn one of the things that i've noticed which is remarkable is the response generally speaking from community elders and community leaders and i include you rabbi in relation to the sense of calm and reflection required and, and not panic which is really important but it's really important we do the, learn the lessons you alluded to one of them which is us entering lockdown too late but actually we as a country because we're an island we got the virus far later than other countries and i genuinely think we should have been learning from the south koreas the Singapore's, elsewhere in Europe, what they were doing that was working well, what they were doing that work, wasn't working well. And I think we should reflect upon that without arrogance, but with humility and say, we could have done things better. And we need to learn, Rabbi, because there could be another pandemic around the corner or God forbid, a second wave around the corner. Okay, thank you for that. That's actually, actually very profound, if I might say so. But now more precisely, you are the mayor of one of the greatest and most thriving cities in the world. The economy, of course, has been badly impacted by the pandemic. So many stores remain closed. Private businesses have suffered. And so many have actually already gone into liquidation. Um, if I may, I think it's quite magnanimous that you yourself have chosen to take a, a, a pay cut, which in itself is extremely laudable. But let's focus on the West End in particular. It was a ghost town until a week or so ago. I went down there on a weekend just to really take in the scene. And the theater, cinema industry has been so badly hit with concern that some of them might remain permanently closed. Do you see a, a way out? Is there any kind of light on the horizon anytime soon? Or maybe putting the question a little bit differently, what do you actually see as the single biggest challenge as a result of the pandemic impact? Well, look, uh, this is the biggest social, economic and health crisis our country has faced since the Second World War. That's the scale of the challenge uh, that we have. My first response to you is, and this is where you play a big role, and, and I've, I've read some of your sermons, but actually in relation to hope, we've got to give people hope that actually there is a way out, a transition and then a recovery from the worst economic, social and health crisis since the Second World War. We as a city have come through previous tragedies before from uh, previous plagues in previous centuries, great fires, the Blitz in the Second World War, being the receiving end of terrorism, uh, Grenfell Tower, and I could go on. So I'm, I'm optimistic about our future, but it's gonna be a difficult road. The first uh, phase is easing lockdown. And uh, the Prime Minister has announced 
uh, that on the 4th of July, there'll be some relaxation around the museums, the galleries, the cinemas, the bars, the restaurants. That's important. Uh, and as long as it's safe uh, and it's following these scientific advice, I, I cautiously welcome that. We've got to make sure we do things ourselves to keep ourselves safe and others wear a face covering where you can't keep your distance. Make sure we lobby the government to get the test, trace, isolate working well. But you're absolutely right. The economy is crucial. I think you can't disentangle lives and livelihoods. You can't disentangle wealth and health. They're inextricably linked. And I took a decision to take a pay cut because uh, I, I, you've got to lead by example. When I was a lawyer, I used to say to my fellow partners, you can't expect others to photocopy if you're not going to photocopy yourself. You, you can't expect as a leader others to do things you aren't willing to do yourself. And I'm afraid the bad news is that for the foreseeable future, it's going to be difficult for our city in relation to health, but also in relation to jobs. The bad news is, uh, I think, we're looking at uh, levels of unemployment we've not seen since the 1980s. And my fear is, Rabbi, that in the 1980s, we had a generation written off because of mass unemployment. I don't want a generation written off. So what I'm saying to the government is, let's now start supporting those industries. You mentioned culture, hospitality, retail, which won't be able to resume quickly. Rather than businesses going bust, people being made unemployed, let's support them. But in the medium to long term, let's start skilling up now people whose jobs won't be there so they can have jobs and the skills for the jobs that are future proof. OK, but then picking up on that, and I know you've been asked this question before, and if I had a pound for every time someone asked me to ask this question to you, I'd be very well off. But let's ask it anyway. The congestion charge. I mean, a 50 pound theater ticket or a 20 pound cinema ticket is now going to cost 15 pounds extra. Regardless if I go midweek, end of the week, weekend, etc., coupled with the fact that most people don't feel comfortable taking public transport at this stage. So it means that they'll avoid trains, but driving is too expensive. So far, fewer people are likely to visit anywhere in the congestion zone, which means fewer weekend shoppers, fewer cinema or theater goers. How is that supposed to bolster the economy and especially whatever industry operates within that zone? Yeah, really important point. So one of the things that we, we, we Transport for London have suffered since the lockdown in, um, on March 23rd is uh, the, the revenues we receive, we rely upon passengers using the tube, the buses, the trams, the overground has stopped. 90% of our uh, income has dried up and we rely upon our income from fares to pay for the services we provide. And we're like any other business. So we've used our savings. We used, we've got two billion pounds worth of savings. We've We've used our reserves to pay for services. No money's been coming in. And like many businesses, like other transport authorities around the country, we've gone to the government and said, listen, government, I can't continue to run transport in London because there's no money left. I've used my reserves. There's no money coming in. And what the government has done is said, look, Mr. Mayor, we're willing to give you a grant, but we require you to take out a loan, but also we require you to do certain things as the condition for us giving you funding. And one of the conditions the government attached to giving me a grant and uh, was and, and taking out a loan was that I must immediately reintroduce the congestion charge. You remember I stopped it because I realized essential workers and others weren't using uh, other forms of public transport. We need to get them into social London. So we suspended the congestion charge. The government said, you must reintroduce it immediately, but you must also, Mr. Mayor, as a condition of getting this grant, widen the scope which means no longer stopping at 6 p.m., widen the scope, go to 10 p.m., and weekends. And also, Mr. Mayor, you must increase the level of charges from £11.50 to £15. And I had a choice. I either say to the government, I'm not willing to accept your conditions and therefore reject your grant, which would have meant TfL, transport and going bust, no buses, no tubes, no underground, no overground, no trams, or, or reluctantly accepting these typical conditions. Now, there is some cause for optimism. One, I've managed to persuade the government this should be temporary only. So the increase is temporary only. The seven days a week is temporary only. And number two, I've managed to persuade the government to give exemptions for you know people who, because of the pandemic, have to use their cars. For example, if you're a care worker, if you work for the NHS, if you work for a charity and so on. So, you know, I agree with your concerns, which have been expressed to you by the congregation and many others. 
uh, you know, uh, fingers crossed, this is a temporary measure uh, and we'll be able to, you know, go back to a decent level. But the other part I've got to say, Rabbi, is speaking to colleagues around the world, mayors and other leaders, what some cities have had is a car-led recovery. And frankly speaking, we don't want a car-led recovery because the streets in London are so narrow. If there is a slight increase in uh, car usage, our streets would grind to a halt. So we're encouraging a recovery that's walking, cycling, public transport during rush hours, uh, car if you really have to. Uh, we're trying to discourage that where we can. So I'm picking up on that last point, actually. Um, can you clarify whether free bus travel for children is or is not going to be scrapped as part of this? So you make, that's another condition attached to your rights. So there are a number of conditions the government attached to the uh, money to uh, get us going from TfL. One was to reintroduce condition charge. Two was to widen the scope and increase the level of condition charge. Three was to remove free travel for under, under 18s. Four was to attach conditions to older persons uh, travel. Five was to, from January, increase the fares for using public transport. So under 18, uh, I said to the government, it's just, it's, it's put aside the unfairness, it's the poorest Londoners who suffer the most. Uh, and you all know in London, many children go to schools which aren't in walking distance. So I said, look, London is very different to the rest of the country. So A, it's unfair, but B, it's impractical. Where do you draw the line? Under fives, under 11s, buses versus tubes. What about those children who, because they go to a faith school, can't walk to their school, it's some distance away. So I've put the ball back in the government's court. For the moment, it is still free to travel for under 18 year olds. If the government is insistent on me doing this, they've got to come up with a model and a scheme that works because uh, we in TFL can't come up with a model that is effective, uh, but it's also equitable. Because ultimately, if you're going to have two or more kids going on a bus, everybody's going to go back into their cars. Absolutely right. But you know, if you're a mum or a dad and you've got three, four children and they travel more than you know a mile away from home or more than two miles, uh, actually, it's more cost effective than jumping in your car. It's it's a it's a perverse incentive given to you to drive rather than use public transport. But also, you will know because of the way London is. Some of your viewers outside London may not realise this because they send their children to the nearest school. Often in London, you don't go to a school in walking distance. But also in London, we've got some very good faith schools. They could be Jewish faith, they could be uh, Roman Catholic, they could be you know Church of England, they could be Islamic or Hindu. They're not in walking distance. And do we really want mum or dad or carer taking two, three, four children in their car, or even one child, which sometimes could be cheaper than using public transport if you're changing two or three times? Okay, so now let's let's move away from the actual pandemic itself and the other big issue. The Jewish community, as you will be well aware, has been especially vulnerable to anti-Semitic attack. And by all accounts, this has only increased in the last number of years. There was a very real point not all that long ago when it simply didn't feel safe walking as a Jew in the streets of London. In fact, arguably, even during lockdown, it just simply moved from the streets to online, to social media. What more can be done to address this? You know, <clears throat> anti-Semitism is the oldest form of hatred known to man. The way I describe it is it's the canary in the mine. And so you don't need to be Jewish to be affected by anti-Semitism because somebody who is anti-Semitic is often also Islamophobic or is also often racist or is also often anti-black or is often uh, is anti-woman or anti-whatever. So the point I'm trying to get across over the last four years as the mayor is this affects all of us. Actually, because the Jewish community is relatively small, it is more important for those in positions of power and influence to take it more seriously than we otherwise would. Because, but for the grace of God, it could be me being affected by this. And I, I find it unconscionable that in the most progressive city in the world, just because the school you happen to go to is a Jewish faith school, or because the place of worship you go to is a synagogue, you need protection there from the CST or others, right? And so it's really important that, that I, as your mayor, do what I can to make you feel safe. And I realize there are two parts of this equation. One is your safety. Two is your perception or fear for your safety and your family and your congregation and the like. 
And so firstly, as a Labour politician, I've got to be quite clear and candid. The Labour leadership in recent years has been very poor in dealing with examples of anti-Semitism with members of my own party. I'm really pleased that our new leader, Keir Starmer, is, uh, is undertaking a huge transformative uh, pieces of action to address the issue of anti-Semitism. And uh, that demonstrates to me the Labour leadership nationally gets this. Secondly, it is the case that we've seen uh, a, an increase in anti-Semitism in recent years, uh, uh, you know, not just face to face, not just from criminal damage, but virtually in relation to trolling of in, on Twitter or on Facebook or, or other forms of social media. I've had friends who have left the Labour Party uh, because they were on the receiving end of anti-Semitism on uh, social media. Uh, and the fact that a crime takes place on social media doesn't minimise that it's a crime. Crime is crime. And, and so the first thing I'd say to you is to reassure you, Rabbi, that uh, our commission of Met Police, Krasnodik, has a zero tolerance towards any forms of anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, she understands the importance of dealing with this. The Met Police Service, uh, which I'm responsible for, takes a zero tolerance towards this. We work very closely with the CST. But also, if there are any examples that you or the congregation know about, please make sure you report it to, if not, this, if not the police, if not me, the CST or other organizations, because unless you report it, we can't take action and we don't understand the scale of this challenge. You mustn't suffer in silence. Um, and it's really important you don't. My job as your mayor is to make sure I, I, I'm with you, not simply standing shoulder to shoulder with you. You'll be where I attended shul uh, on the first uh, Sabbath I could after the uh, horrific uh, attack in the synagogue in America. Really important we show solidarity with you. And so it's really important you feel as safe as you can do. And so you mustn't assume this is trivial. This is not serious. Nobody was hurt. No, it is serious because today it's name calling on Twitter. Tomorrow that could be somebody suffering the ultimate loss of life because they happen to be Jewish. All right. So actually, thank you for that. And it's very important. I appreciate and I know the community as a whole will appreciate very much your encouragement and your support in that sort of way. But now broadening that out, especially in light of recent riots and whatnot in regard to general racism, um, apparently, according to statistic, if you are from black, Asian or minority ethnic background, you are nine times more likely to be stopped by the police. Do you think that the UK actually suffers from systemic racism? Firstly, look, there is racism in the UK. Right? We shouldn't pretend there isn't. By the way, one of the things we've got to educate people about is anti-Semitism is racism. Right? That we kind of have a hierarchy of racism. Racism is racism, and we've got to make sure we call it out. The bad news is there is, there is racism in, in the UK. The bad news is there is racism in London. And I say that as the mayor of the greatest city in the world, that's also the most progressive city in the world. And the point I made generally is, if there's racism, and I include anti-Semitism in London, just imagine what it's like in, in lesser progressive parts of our country and lesser progressive parts of the world. And, you know, the, the, the reality is the brutal way George Floyd was killed in Minnesota, uh, Minneapolis, USA, has, in my mind, shun a light on the racism black people face. Now, you and I both suffer discrimination uh, because of our faith, because of our identity, because of who we are. And I think we've got to have empathy to realize that if you're a black person, actually the racism you suffer is humongous. Uh, racism, discrimination, uh, 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 you know, uh, it really, really is, is a big issue that's suffered by the black community. And George Floyd's brutal killing struck a chord with black people, not just in America, but around the world, because they were thinking, but for the grace of God, that could have been me, my son, my dad, my uncle, my cousin. And that's why we've got to show solidarity, Rabbi, whether you're Jewish or Muslim, whether you're uh, somebody with that color skin or whether you're somebody who is white. Uh, we've got to show solidarity with the black community who are really feeling it, not just in stop and search, the numbers of young black children who are excluded, the number of young black people who don't get the grades they deserve, that don't have their potential fulfilled, the, the lack of black people going to top universities, the lack of black judges, the lack of, the lack of black magistrates, the lack of black people in the cabinet, um, the too many black people in our prisons, the longer, harsher sentences given to black people by our judges and our magistrates, 
the, the dirt of black people in the media and I could go on. So this is this is the solidarity that just like other communities have got to show the Jewish community when it comes to anti-Semitism, I think we've got to show to uh, black brothers and sisters when it comes to Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter doesn't just affect black people, it affects all of us who care about living in a fair, just, equal society, whether you're a rabbi, a, an imam, whether you're of Pakistani origin or of Israeli origin, whatever your background or heritage, all of us should understand this is a mainstream issue. And my worry is, Rabbi, that I worry that unless we take advantage of this uh, window of opportunity, the caravan may leave and we'll move on to other things. And that's why it's so encouraging that you and I, a Jewish person, a Muslim person, not, none of us directly affected, we're not, we're not black, are talking about it, which is wonderful because, you know, people watching this, they may say, well, why did this affect me? It affects you because if black people aren't having their potential fulfilled, it affects you. If black people in our city don't feel equal citizens, it affects you. If you run a business, but you're not employing the best talent because black people aren't getting the best results they deserve in schools, it affects you. So it affects all of us. Okay, thank you really very much for that point. Um, but following on from that, because within all of this response now, you have started a commission to review London landmarks. And frankly, in principle, that stands to reason. But first of all, can we really judge historical figures by our own 21st century standards? And really, by extension, I mean, these statues are more to reflect on history rather than endorsement of the figures represented. Isn't it better to keep the reminders there rather than just simply to whitewash it. Uh, and more precisely, um, where do we draw the line? I mean, so we can take down the statue, arguably, of Cecil Rose, but continue using his scholarship money? Or what about Richard, the Lionheart's coronation, which sparked pogroms of unprecedented severity back in the day against English Jews? Are we going to take that one down and out of Parliament Square as well? Well, first, let me just, you know, cards on, cards on the table. Uh, a commission for diversity in the public realm isn't going to solve the issues of racism, discrimination, and inequality, right? It won't. But there is a role uh, for us to look into what happens across our city and ask the question, does the public realm, the public spaces, not just statues, street names, names of squares, murals, blue plaques, does that properly reflect the contribution to our city's greatness made by all sorts of people, people of colour, black people, Asian, minority ethnics, Jewish people, women, uh, LGBTQ plus people, people who are disabled. I'll give you one example, Rabbi. I became mayor in May 2016, and within a week of becoming mayor, a petition was given to me from a woman called Caroline Credo Perez. And she made a really interesting point. She said, when I jog around Parliament Square, I see statues of 11 great people. All 11 are men. All 11 are men, not one woman. Are you saying, Mr. Mayor, not one woman has contributed to the greatness of London and our country. And a campaign began led by Caroline, which led to, in 2018, us unveiling the first statue of a woman, Melissa Forsyth, a huge campaigner for women's equality and the right of women to vote, is now in Parliament Square. Now, I'm not saying that one statue of a woman will, will, will make it uh, our society you know, gender fair, but it's really important that people see examples of uh, themselves, but also others have made a contribution and so what we're doing is it's not a commission about taking down statues for the sake of taking down statues. It's the same question. Do our street names, do our you know, street squares, public squares, uh, do our murals, our blue plaques properly reflect the contribution made by, made by Londoners of today and of yesteryear as well? Uh, for example, I do think that we in London should have a, uh, a memorial to commemorate um, you know, uh, slavery, what happened in slavery. I'm somebody who was one of the judges for the uh, the Holocaust Memorial, uh, the Education uh, Holocaust Memorial uh, next to the House of Parliament. It's, the symbolism is really important, Rabbi, for that to be where we want it to be. Uh, and, and so our public spaces do matter. I'm not somebody who says, you know, pull down the statue of Churchill or, or you know, take down the statue of uh, Glaston. What I'm saying is actually, We've got to look at our public space and ask ourselves the questions. They probably celebrate the contribution made by uh, people today and yesterday as well. Albeit arguably, it shouldn't then necessarily be drawn with statues. I mean, 
we should then start discussing about what music is being played on our radio, what books we have in our library, etc. There's some of that that can effectively be highly offensive as well. So it kind of does put the question of where we would ultimately draw the line. There's a great, there's a great, uh, there's a great Churchill uh, quote which said, "You know, history will be kind to me because I'll write it." I'm paraphrase what Churchill said. And so the, the point is, who is in charge of our public space? Who's in charge of what goes in our museums? Uh, the music that's played, somebody's clearly in charge. And, uh, you know, those of us who aren't represented either in uh, the displays in museums or galleries or in street names or in statues would like a piece of the action. Uh, and so, you know, as well as I do, the great Jewish people have contributed to culture, the arts, uh, literature, politics. Uh, for a young Jewish Londoner, when he or she walks around London, where do they see examples of these role models who have been fantastic uh, artists, fantastic politicians? And that leads to them having greater aspiration and ambition. And, you know, I want everyone to see examples of successful stories that they can aspire to be like them. So, for example, who decided a certain square is called whatever it is, or street is called what it is, or, you know, when it comes to English heritage, choosing the blue plaques, why are a significant majority, a significant majority of, of uh, white men? I mean, aren't there great women as well who've made massive contributions towards our city and our country? And so the diversity isn't just about uh, a color, it's also about gender. Where are the statues or the recognition of the great disabled people who've made a massive contribution towards uh, our city? And so the point the commission is doing is getting together 15 independent experts, 15 independent minded people, it won't be me, deciding what goes on. These 15 independent judges will be looking at um, the contribution made by different communities and will be reflecting going forward what should happen in our city. And by the way, it's got to be a partnership approach because you're right, uh, I'm not in charge of the museums or the galleries or the universities or many of the streets are our responsibility of council. So it's a partnership approach and part of this will be Rabbi, education, uh, learning the real history, making sure people understand the balance uh, in relation to the context. You mentioned uh, Cecil Rose, context matters. And so, for example, if there is a statue of somebody who has got a complicated history, explaining that complicated history in relation to the plaque. Some people though, for me, there's uh, there's, there's no equivocation. A slaver is a slaver. I think slavers should, shouldn't be commemorated or memorialized or celebrated in the way they have in, 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 in previous years. Okay, let's step out of London and into the Middle East because you had your fair share of comments and involvement in Middle East politics. I mean, you called out Trump on declaring Jerusalem as the capital. You called for a ban on Al Quds Day. Now, of course, is the big question of annexation, and I, I wonder if you'd like to comment on that in particular, but maybe also more broadly, do you think peace is ever really achievable in the Middle East? I think it is. I think it, is. it has to be, doesn't it? And I think it is. And unless people like you and I are hopeful about the possibility of peace, the alternative is just not worth thinking about, which is a lack of hope, which leads to not apathy, but cynicism, which leads to destructive attitudes. Uh, you know, I'm somebody who's an advocate of, uh, you know, uh, two state solution, two states that are viable and secure, uh, getting on with each other. I think it can't be beyond the wit of people in that part of the world to find a solution. I appreciate the challenges. I'm not naive. I appreciate the uh, history. Uh, one of the things that I've tried to do is in a non-pompous way, and, and forgive me if this sounds really arrogant, but to demonstrate to the world how in London we can be a beacon for a good future. You know, uh, when I am invited, as I often am, to uh, synagogues, to, uh, you know, uh, not this year, but Passover, Peace Act Mills, or to bar mitzvahs, or to events, you know, uh, in uh, in Jewish homes and Jewish uh, families, uh, Hanukkah in Trafalgar Square. Uh, the point I make is just imagine the impact it has when people see a male of Islamic faith being welcomed so warmly by, uh, by by Jewish friends and and vice versa when it comes to the friendship and fraternity showed by mosques in London with their Jewish cousins. You have seen the friendship around Grenfell with uh, the Almanara Mosque there uh, and the Jewish communities who came in to help out uh, that, that those people affected by Grenfell Tower. And I've got many examples of doing iftars as a Muslim in synagogues and of, uh, of rabbis and others of Jewish faith coming to mosques to open the fast with us. 
And what I try and do in an arrogant way, Rabbi, is to show that it's possible for us to get on, not simply tolerate each other. You don't want to be tolerated. You tolerate two things. You want to be respected, celebrated, embraced. And look, I don't pretend I've got all the solutions for the Middle East challenges. Uh, I try not to give a running commentary on affairs that happen around the world unless it affects our city. But I'm cognizant of the fact that actually, um, you know, that the, that the impacts of events 3,000 miles away, there's a ripple effect that affects us in this city and, and our country. And so, look, you know, I think there are lots of decent people on all sides who want to uh, come up with a solution that works for everybody. I think it's not beyond the wit of us. I think in any country, there are leaders that people disagree with. Uh, I mean, you know, you know my prime, the prime minister of this country is Boris Johnson. I disagree hugely with a lot of the things he does and he says. Similarly in Israel, a lot of people don't agree with the, the policies of the current prime minister. And we mustn't, we mustn't make sweeping generalizations or stereotype people. And, and I'm optimistic, Rabbi. I mean, you know, the fact that you and I can have a conversation half an hour in a really fraternal way. And you know, the first question you asked me was how I was and my family was. I mean, that, that, sh that shows the basic decency that people have and you have and our faiths have. And so I'm optimistic. And I think, you know, sure, I think, I think our generation hasn't been great. I think the previous generation hasn't been great, but I think the next generation, uh, we've got to be hopeful that they learn from our errors of our generation and uh, can find, you know, a, a peaceful two-state solution. It's really important they do. All right, if I might finish off with, it, with a final question. Everybody's using the language new normal. I mean, my, I'm, I'm still grappling within myself to ascertain whether there will be a fundamental change in civilization that somehow these last three and a half months have been some kind of reset button. I, I wonder what your perspective on that is, whether there'll be some kind of broader change in light of everything that we've just discussed. Will people's attitudes, sensitivities, etc., be somewhat different because we've all been exposed as being so utterly vulnerable? Or is this simply ultimately going to be reverted back to some kind of sad piece of history? And just as a second of that, just in reference to you yourself, I know, of course, you announced in 2018 that you're standing for re-election. What are your goals and your ambitions in that new term? Well, I think you and I both know that the, the, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different result. And I think we've got to learn from this global pandemic and learn the right lessons. What we can't afford to do is return to business as usual. And, and I actually like the phrase a new normal. I think it's really important for us to think about the lessons we need to learn from this global pandemic, from the origins and the way we treat livestock, uh, uh, really important, up to what this uh, pandemic has done, which is, you know, shine a spotlight on the fragility of our society, but also highlighted the structural inequalities that exist uh, in our society and some of the challenges there are going forward. And so I would like a new normal to be where we understand there are some jobs zero hours contract jobs, jobs in the gig economy, which uh, disproportionately affect certain communities. We're going to be addressing them, giving them good employment protection. I met Rabbi too many people who were saying, look, if I don't go to work, I've not got money to put food on the table or, or to pay my bills. And so I may have the symptoms, but I'm afraid I'm going to take the risk and go to work because I've got to put food on the table. That can't be right. We know about overcrowding and housing leading to an acceleration of the virus uh, spreading. We know uh, that too often politicians have, uh, you know, used politics as a motivation for making decisions rather than the science and what the expert advice is. We know that sometimes the economy has trumped health when it comes to decisions and I could go on. And so there's got to be a new normal. One of the things we can't have going forward is uh, invested in jobs that aren't conducive to the future. So I'd like a, 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 a new normal that's green, where we have people thinking about you know, jobs that are future proof. You will know at the end of uh, this year, we'll be leaving the European Union. Well, if we're leaving the European Union, we're going to be thinking about our future as a country of 66 million people only, not 600 million as a member of the EU. What is our uh, USP in relation to being a, a, a small to medium sized country when it comes to a global economy? So the new normal gives us an opportunity to address these very uh, issues. And so it's really important we think about that, how we look after our elderly. elderly. You will know actually, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, particularly older people have suffered hugely with this uh, virus because they're vulnerable underlying health conditions and their age. The new normal should ask the question, how do we look after older people? How do, what should we be invested in care homes? Is it acceptable to be cutting corners? 
or should we be investing in excellence like you know Jewish care does uh, for, for many older Jewish people so the new normal really does uh, matter and I think it's really important we take the opportunity to to learn and one of the great things about the Jewish faith is actually and I had this conversation both with the, the chief rabbi but also separately with the archbishop in, in the Church of England was you know some of the, some of our religions have got centuries worth of experience of coming out of catastrophe uh, and how you come out of catastrophe the transition the recovery the hope and so we need to learn from faith community and faith leaders about the experience they have to have a, a new normal it's really important in relation to to, to myself i'll, I'll be saying that again to be uh, the, the mayor the election has been postponed from may 2020 to may 2021 i'm looking forward to over the next uh, few months making sure we come from uh, lockdown to being eased to a transition to a recovery. I've not in the recent past, and I won't for the for the near future, be thinking about re-election. I'll just do my best to be the best possible mayor I can. I, I campaigned on something I called, Rabbi, the London Promise. And the London Promise is very simple. You work hard, there's a helping hand, and you can achieve anything. And my concern has been in the recent past, many Londoners are working hard, but there's no helping hand. And they're frustrated because that means they can't fulfill their potential and my job as the mayor is to be the helping hand uh, not just for uh, jewish londoners but for people from all backgrounds all faiths all ethnic origins different genders to make sure all londoners can have their potential fulfilled well thank you so so very much i really appreciate it this has been great as you highlighted a number of times throughout the conversation this opportunity to share just across faiths, as it were, as individuals, and of course yourself as the mayor and me as a rabbi in this great city. I'm, I'm really appreciative of your time and uh, I wish you and your family well, and of course the best of luck in the upcoming election. Thank you, bless you, and uh, love to your family, and uh, thank you very much for all that you're doing, Rabbi.